Thanks to Curiosity Stream for supporting my channel. Give yourself the gift of watching my videos ad free and getting access to my extended videos for less than $12 a year when you sign up for Curiosity Stream and Nebula using the link in the description. Is bigger actually better? When it comes to language models, DeepMind is trying to find out. Hey y'all, it's Jordan, welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, consider subscribing to stay up to date on AI news, and you can also check out some of the previous videos that I have done on large language models. But since we have a lot to cover for this video, let's just dive right into DeepMind's newest research. So late last week, DeepMind announced that they had developed a 208 billion parameter language model. For context, GPT-3 was 175 billion parameters, so about 100 billion more parameters than the last large language model that caught the wave of popular media. It's technically not the largest large language model that we're aware of at the moment. NVIDIA announced that they had developed a 530 billion parameter model called Megatron Turing, which as an aside, if I remember correctly, Megatron was the leader of the Decepticons in the Transformers toy series franchise, and they were the evil villains, so I don't know what that says about this model, but whatever. In any case, DeepMind released three papers, one focusing on their new model called Gopher, which looks at how scaling models to larger and larger sizes affects their performance on various benchmarks that have become fairly standard in the language model community. And this is an interesting question because as we've seen as language models have continued to grow over the past few years as people have thrown more and more compute at language models, there's been a question as to whether or not there comes a point where the improvements that you see on the state-of-the-art benchmarks actually starts to plateau as you increase scale and whether or not there are other things that we should be doing in order to make our language models smarter. There are also lots of concerns around the environmental impact and the feasibility and logistics of developing models like this. So at the end of the paper, they actually have a model card for Gopher, the largest model, and one of the things they note is that it is not feasible for them to retrain Gopher in its entirety at the moment. But with their existing model, they had a lot of really interesting results. So they tested Gopher against a bunch of different tasks and found that they had improved performance on STEM and medicine, humanities and ethics, reading comprehension, and fact-checking. This was largely attributed to the fact that Larger models trained on larger data sets can memorize more information and can therefore perform better on these types of essentially memorization based tasks. They also tested model toxicity and bias and found that as the model size increases, it does better at essentially mitigating toxicity and bias in the model, but it's still definitely an issue. One of the actually really interesting things that they did was that they tested the performance of Gopher on AABE or African American Vernacular English versus white aligned Twitter posts to see whether the model performed differently on essentially different dialects of English. And what they found was that the distribution that the model expected from the samples that it was generating was consistently worse aligned with the AAV samples than the white samples. So even with this increased performance in the scaled up model, we still have to remember that a lot of the performance depends on the data that we're giving the model. And if you look at different dialects of English or other languages, you might see a hit in performance. At the end of the paper, they also report on the CO2 emissions that were generated by training Gopher. They trained it for 920 hours in November and December of 2020, which is crazy, and essentially found that they emitted an estimated 380 net tons of CO2 compared to 550 for GPT-3, or compared to roughly 300 tons of CO2 per passenger jet round trip from London to New York. So a round trip flight from London to New York would release less CO2 into the atmosphere than training this model did for two months, which isn't great. But that's why this has been an area of a lot of interest for people who are working in large language models or large models in general to see whether or not we can develop systems that allow us to train these models and use them more efficiently while still getting those same results. And interestingly, DeepMind does actually address this in their third paper of the announcement from last week in a model called Retro. This is a smaller model they developed that only has 7 billion parameters, so in other words, about 1 25th the size of Gopher, that still was able to match Gopher in terms of performance on the different language model benchmarks. And this is super interesting because, you know, large tech companies have definitely been leaning into language models as of late, and up until now it seemed like the best way to essentially improve performance for these models was to either increase parameters, increase compute, or increase the scale of the model. 
Retro allows DeepMind to basically circumvent a lot of those things by creating a database of text that the model can compare to the text that it's going to generate in order to improve the quality of the eventual output. Importantly, this also theoretically means that you can see which samples the model used as a reference to improve the quality of the output and essentially curate that database in order to remove misinformation or reduce bias. All right, so how does Retro actively work? Well, essentially you can see from this graphic here, I actually highly recommend checking out their blog post because they have great blog posts in general that are fairly easy to understand if you don't have any expertise in machine learning. But essentially you start with the input sequence and go into our retrieval database, which gives us a bunch of related fragments of text, fragments of training data that could be used to essentially complete the input sequence that we're given. And by using these examples that it pulls from the database, it can generate an output sequence that actually is ideally a higher fidelity one, one that is more accurate, one that makes more sense, and is one that we can then go back and see, you know, what were the neighbors as shown here that were used to generate this so that we can figure out in the event that this answer is wrong or off or weird in some way, what was wrong in our data set and fix that. So in short, I thought that this was a super interesting paper. I'm definitely looking forward to seeing what else they do with language models after this. They actually don't go into the CO2 emissions for retro, but considering that it's such a smaller model compared to something like Gopher, I'm guessing that the emissions that you see from that are also greatly reduced, which is hopefully good for the future of developing models like this. But if you'd like to see a deeper dive into these papers, there's three of them. I only covered the highlights because after reading like 50 to 60 pages of research, I realized that there was no way that I was going to be able to make a video of any reasonable length where I covered all of the interesting details. You can let me know in the comments and I can make a Nebula Plus version of this video. If you haven't heard, Nebula is a streaming platform built by me and some of my friends, including people like Tierzu, Simon Clark, and Marquez Brownlee. On Nebula, you can find ad-free versions of all of our videos, plus bonus content in our Nebula Plus videos for those times when you have to read three papers for a video and realize that the resulting video would be an hour long if you didn't cut a lot of stuff out. You'd also get access to our Nebula Originals, which you can't find anywhere else, including a very good trivia show where I competed against Brian from Real Engineering and Dave from City Beautiful in a bunch of fun and bizarre challenges, including trying to build an Ikea chair while answering math problems. And the best way to sign up for Nebula is actually through CuriosityStream, who are kindly sponsoring today's video. They're also offering a crazy holiday discount on this bundle so you can get it for just $12 a year. CuriosityStream is a subscription streaming service with thousands of documentaries and non-fiction videos. In fact, if you're interested in behind the scenes content from another one of my friends, I would highly recommend checking out their documentary Behind the Spotlight, which tells the story of how Mr. Beast became, well, Mr. Beast. CuriosityStream loves independent creators and wants to help us grow our platform, so if you click on the link in the description or use my promo code Jordan, you can get access to CuriosityStream for 42% off their annual plans, with Nebula included for free for as long as you are a CuriosityStream member. That's less than $12 a year. Signing up for Nebula and CuriosityStream is a great way to directly support my channel while getting to watch my videos ad-free, and this is the time to sign up if you're going to do it. This holiday deal only comes once a year. So sign up for CuriosityStream and Nebula at CuriosityStream.com Jordan or using the promo code Jordan.